Hopefully the mouse ain't affected as well. Scroll down to this one. Okay, hi everyone. So it seems like everyone's ready to go. So let's get started. Um, so um, if this is your first lecture that you're attending for the day, well, welcome. Um, hope you had a fun open day uh, and hope you learn about Hong Kong U and then what we do here. And then today you're also going to learn some very interesting things about psychology as well. Um, so let me quickly introduce our first speaker. So it's my great honor to introduce Professor Tasha Lee, who's also our department head. So So Professor Lee is an expert in, uh, where do I begin? All wow. things neuroscience. So Professor Lee is an expert in brain mechanisms that drive all, all sorts of different thinking and emotional processes that occur throughout our whole lifespan. Um, and her work touches on topics that there's too many to touch on here. So I'll just let Professor Lee get into it. Okay, yep. thank you, Andrew, for a very kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. And let me, on behalf of the department, welcome you to this series of mock lectures. Welcome. And uh, of course, this is the University of Hong Kong, the oldest building. And yeah, welcome to the university too. And today I'm going to talk about something called neuroplasticity. It's not saying that our brain is plastic. Neuro is a brain. Plastic doesn't mean our brain is plastic, meaning that our brain, in fact, is moldable. Before I proceed, then let me introduce who I am or who am I. Uh, professionally, I am a registered clinical psychologist, but my clinical specialty is in neuropsychology. And I'm a board certified clinical neuropsychologist, so I'm interested in investigating research-wise, you know, the neural processes happening in the brain. And last week, we just uh, held a international symposium calling the galaxy of brain sciences. Professionally, I see patients with, you know, apart from depression, anxiety, I see patients with mostly with brain problem, dementia, uh, stroke, tumor, and so on, assessing their cognitive function and, you know, seeing their progress. So without further ado, let me start the first slide. The concept of neuroplasticity. It is the ability of the brain of re to reorganize its structure, function, connections, according to experience. This is extremely important because when we were born, our brain is not fully mature. Um, you know, the hardware, in fact, we thought maybe the baby's brain is already mature. No, in fact, there's a lot of wiring going on. That's the hardware. And in human brain, the latest development is in this particular part of the brain we call frontal region and it's not fully mature until early 20s. So that's why for parents here then, and for youngsters here, when you hit your adolescence then, your brain are not fully mature. So there's a lot of conflict between, you know, uh, parents and children, adolescents, and it's all because that, you know, the brain is about to mature. So do bear with your parents and do bear with your children or adolescent children, all right? Why? then our brain can change with experiences. It's because whenever something happened to us, and you know, even for me standing here, even though if I'm, not, I'm not saying anything, but I do see different things happening, then there's firing going through my eyes to the brain and each firing will have an effect on the connection between the different neurons we call the synapse. The more the firing happen, uh, the stronger the connection would be. And believe it or not, our human, human brain's you know, uh, uh, information passage is following that 1010 principle, all right? And following uh, what we call our electromagnetic, our electrochemical process, which we're not going to talk about it. All right, more about how experiences change our brain. Not amateur musician, but professional musician, of course, they practice many, many hours. And for example, those who play string instrument, when they practice for many, many hours then, we all know that our brain, the, the control of our brain, in fact, is crossover. So our right hand is being regulated by our left hemisphere and the left hand or left part of the body is being regulated by right hemisphere, all right? So it's like that. So, and that's why if somebody is playing a string instrument, if they practice it, you know, uh, for a prolonged period of time, 
Then what we call the representation of this index finger, there is a very clear representation in the brain here, will enlarge because of that experience. And for some professional musician, then if they practice it for a long time, so there's enlargement of the representation of the index finger and at the same time an enlargement of the representation of the middle finger. Unfortunate event happened is that the representation overlap with each other. Then when they press the index finger in unintentionally, they will also press the, ring, uh, the middle finger. So that is problematic. And uh, not, only, not only is that representation is enlarged for professional musician, you know, when we appreciate the meaning of sound, this is a temporal region here, uh, there's a gyrus here. And in fact, the uh, Hushko gyrus, uh, a gyrus in the temporal region, it is larger than the control, meaning people who are not professional musicians. So that's how our brain change. And I'm going to quickly talk about another one, the London taxi driver. And uh, you will not see the change now because we all use GPS or Google map or whatever. But in the past, they had to remember the way around to navigate around in an old city without order. And um, then people found that in fact, a region in the brain that is for the navigation of the, you know, uh, in the spatial navigation, in fact, is much larger compared with people who are not a professional driver. So that's how experience changed the brain, all right? And I'm just quickly show to you, but I'm going to skip this slide. And uh, I collaborated with another team and we tried to develop something. Hopefully one day we could use it for people, apply to people who unfortunately lost their sight. So we call it a bachelor device. So basically we blindfold this poor student here. All right. And then ask this poor student to practice navigating based on the ultrasound. So with this bachelor is that it will emit ultrasound uh, ultrasound will return back and there's two receiver here. So that's why we call it a betcha. So then they will learn to navigate and to start with it, there was a lot of errors and the brain is sort of like the brain signal is very uh, random. But with practice then, the person learned about the integration of the sound signal to spatial navigation. So I'm just using it as an illustration how magical our brain is, we learn. And for braille reading, people who don't have their sight, braille reading. And for vision, then it is our occipital lobe here, the back of the brain, that is for processing visual information. But for those who do the braille reading, supposedly this is tactile, which will go to what we call the parietal lobe here, but that will go to the occipital lobe as if they see. All right, so it's very, very magical. So this is what we did. And of course, the good news is that, you know, because our brain is able to be reorganized and it's very plastic. So that's why even for patients who suffer from traumatic brain injury or youngsters who suffer from epilepsy needed to either remove even half of the brain, one hemisphere. Now, if you have one hemisphere removed, then basically you can't use this part of the body. But for youngsters with training, eventually they regain all the function because the brain, you organize the function to the other side. So the half of the brain carry out all the functions like a normal uh, person. So we talk about, now trust that, all right? This is going to be very interesting. Neuroplastic change induced by physical experience. So we, I can't lock up human subjects in a lab. So we use animal, I collaborated with animal neuroscientists. So basically we have a group of rats that we allow the rats to run. There's another group of rats that we lock the wheel so the rats couldn't run. So what is the outcome? The outcome is that those who run, in fact, has more, a higher level of endogenous proliferation of stem cells. All right. And since this study then, uh, my collaborator continued on to do a lot of study looking at exercise. And uh, of course, uh, he mapped out the neural pathway and everything. So exercise is very important. Exercise is very important for protecting the aging brain. So for those who are here, if you have older folks, advise them to do exercise, all right? And young sir, do the exercise. You need that stem cells, all right? So 
with the exercise group, then there is a normalized hippocampal self proliferation. There is an increase in hippocampal brain derived neurotrophic factor level, which is good, of course. And based on the system level, then exercise improves what we call memory of you know, the spatial memory, nonverbal memory, and also exercise in a way. I mean, when we first started this topic, we will look, I, I propose this idea is to see whether exercise has a protective effect against mood dysregulation. So in fact, we found that, is that in the animal study is that it decreased depression-like behavior in rats. Okay, so exercise is very important. How about doing cognitive training for older people? Do it, and we started, created a program and uh, invited older folks to be a participant and do it. And different things, training the attention, training the memory, and training the, uh, you know, the working memory and everything. So what I really wanted to say is that, uh, you know, our, finding our findings clearly indicated that training induced improvement in auditory and visual spatial attention and working memory. So meaning that participating, in fact, has a very positive and strong effect on the brain. But how about if we do not do anything? Of course, if I, I keep on rubbing my fingers like this and I'm doing it three times a day and every time 15 minutes, in three months time, if you scan my brain, you see that representation of this index finger will be enlarged on this side. Okay, but if you have to, you have to keep doing it, all right? But how about without physical input? If we just think about something, would that change the brain? We did that study. Of course, we can't see something that cannot be seen. So we used uh, imaging scanner, uh, MRI imaging scanner here, and then it, we do something called a functional neural imaging. I mean, some of you may know that magnetic resonance imaging as physical examination, but there's sort of a sub, uh, software that can be installed there. Then when we ask a person to be in the scanner, then, then we give the person a task, then the person will perform the task and through computational thing, then we could see the in vivo brain signals in the brain. All right, so we did that. So we compare some people who are trained in focusing their attention. Okay, they just train to focus attention. There's another group of people who are trained to do the mood regulation with number of years of, this is a cross-sectional study we call, with number of years of practice, we realized that those who got trained in atten focusing attention, will have their attention network being very activated and their attention functions improved. And whereas for those who are doing the emotion thing, the emotion network, in fact, is heightened and is more active. So here we identify the result, training attention, then attention network will be uh, much better. Training emotion, then the emotion network, in fact, is a bit stronger. So meaning that what we think that's an exercise, what we call general effect. What we think will change the specific network associated with that thought. Okay, that, so that's the important message. So then we move on to say, okay, if that's so, can we do emotion type of training, you know, to help people to regulate their emotion? So we did a sort of an eight week training, uh, you know, to two groups of older people. And I just like to draw to your attention of the behavioral finding here. Here. So basically, before we started the training, we asked them to look at some emotional picture. For positive picture, you just give them a rating, so it's five. A negative picture, you also give a rating, say minus three, something like that. And interestingly, before the training, we got a, a, a control group. There's no significant difference in the rating, what we call the valence index. But after the training, the valence score of the mind training group decrease significantly. So what happened? After the training, it's not that they're happier. It's not that they rate stimuli towards a positive end. In fact, they rate all the emotional stimuli more towards the, the neutral end. So that, that's why there is a significant decrease in the valence rating. So meaning what? Meaning that external emotional stimuli are less effective or will less affect them to away before the training, okay? 
So as a conclusion, mind training is very important. The way you think will change your brain, will change how you see the world. If you ruminate, keep on ruminating on negative things, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail. I'm the worst person on earth. Then your, your, body, your, your body image and schema will change accordingly, all right? So that's why we always say think positive. And also after the training through the uh, magnetic resonance imaging signal, there's a reduced reactivity to negative affective information. So finally, how much time I have? Okay, great. Finally, with that brain training, so what shall we do? Okay, so one day I was in a taxi and coming back to the university, the taxi driver asked me, so, so are, you, are you a teacher at the university? I said, yes. So what do you teach? I said, psychology. Ah, that's great. I have a question for you, he said. He said, my son who studied for dictation and the day before he studied it, he remembered it very well. But the day, on the day to do the examination, he forgot everything. So what shall I do? I said, very easy, all right, practice, all right? Now, if you do dictation of your piano, uh, pres uh, you know, a presentation, whatever, make sure that when you practice, you don't practice just to 100%. You have to over practice. Now, if you say practice it to 100% the first time, your wiring, remember the very first line with those neurons, your wiring is not strong enough. So that's why after you hit it 100%, you have to keep on repeating it until the wiring is very strong. Then it will stay in your long-term memory, all right? Now, when you have to do stage performance and you have to go for 120% to 130%, reason why when you're on a stage, you must have that anxiety. That anxiety will discount 30% of your performance. So you heat up the 120%, then you will be performing about 90%, you'll find. But if you just hit that 100%, when you're up on the stage, you will only have 60 to 70%. So do remember that. So if you try to memorize something, once you hit 100%, you have to repeat, all right? You have to repeat. Because as number four here, repetition matters. So we start with it, you use it or you lose it. So meaning that for certain brain function, you use it, otherwise, here is a little bit too strong a word. You don't lose it, but it will, it will go into a hibernation. It will sleep. So until one day you call it back, all right? And then I use it and improve it. The more practice makes perfect. This is the wisdom there, okay? So that's very important. And I said that I talked about it before. So whatever you do, I rub the finger, then it's a finger that is enlarged, or, or the representation of fingers enlarged. You think about certain things, you think about positive things, it's the positive network that is being more active. And repetition matter. And intensity is also matter, but it doesn't mean that you have to keep on doing it because we all are psychologists, we have that famous inverted U curve. All right, you study, and with a bit of stress, your performance will come up to the peak. But if you keep pushing it, then it will come down. And let me share with you a little bit of clinical work. I know my time is almost up. So patients, I mean, after suffering from head injury, then they recover, they have to do rehabilitation and to do mobility, you know, training and so on. Then they are eager to get better. There's some of my patients, family members are eager to get them to see them getting better. So when people are having lunchtime break, that they will do the walking again. And then when people are having tea break or rest for the day, they walk again. So at the end of the day, they didn't gain. They didn't gain much. And in fact, they hurt the musculoskeletal system. All right. I always say for people suffering from brain injury, unfortunately, that brain recovery is not like a straight line. It's always like a staircase. So all of a sudden there is an improvement and, and then then after that while, it seems to be there's no change no matter how hard you do it. And then all of a sudden it goes up again. The reason why I interpret it is that the brain needs time, you know, to repair. The brain needs time to rebuild. So you can't expect it to go like that, all right? Last but not the least, remember we say we have to do physical exercise. How about brain exercise? Especially if you have a, you know, older folks and parents at home, 
do encourage them to do exercise and physical exercise, but, but as well mental ex brain exercise. And we're eager to do body check every day, uh, every year, not every day. But how many of us, in fact, really, you know, do the brain check? All right. And in fact, if you know, the brain is the organ that regulate all our thinking and our behavior. It is such a vital organ. So thank you very much. Yep. So thank you so much, Professor Lee, for the really interesting talk. So we maybe have a bit of time. Does anyone have any questions for Professor Lee? Maybe we have time to take one. It, it, it doesn't have to be an academic. It can be a professional question. <laughs> can be anything. Yes. In a way, yes. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy, I don't know whether my my colleague, Professor Jean, is going to talk about uh, CBTA. It's a very uh, prevalent type of uh, school therapy in Hong Kong. So basically is that cognitive is the cognition. So therapy to instill changes in cognition, in the way you think about something. I mean, on in a shallow form of explaining CBTA, right? So you change your schema, your thought on something, then you change the behavior. So meaning that if you see things from another angle, I thought, you know, I thought Andrew rejected me because Andrew didn't smile at me. So then I kept on building up this thought and I'm not going to interact with Andrew. But then later on when I realized, no, Andrew wasn't feeling well the day. So the non-smiling is not because he rejected me. So I saw it from another angle. Then I changed my belief about, you know, Andrew's, you know, nonverbal behavior. Then I changed my behavior, all right? But that's, I said, is a very shallow form of understanding CBT because no change can happen without changing our core belief then our emotional system, all right? But here, we don't have time to dwell into that. So basically, you change your cogn cognitive belief, your schema, that will change your affective way of processing thing and that will change your behavior so basically it's something like that but you look at another school i mean there's another school called psychodynamic psychotherapy they, they try to focus on the emotional part and bring about change in your emotional being and connect to your cognition so then will bring about a change in your behavior so it's just one is top down one is bottom up in a way simpler form okay Yep, so that's a really good question. Thank you for asking. And again, please help me thank uh, Professor Lee for the really nice talk. Okay, thank you. Right, so I'll just very quickly introduce our next speaker. So Dr. Shirley Lee is going to be talking to us now. So Dr. Shirley Lee, her area of expertise is all about sleep. So sleep, obviously very important, affects all of us. Um, maybe some of us don't get enough. Uh, and Today, we're going to hear about how sleep affects our different thinking processes and also even different types of clinical disorders. So if you're lacking in sleep, you've got to pay attention. Hello? Hello? Right, so. okay. Thanks, Andrew. Can you, can you hear me properly? Because it sounds very... Or maybe I will just... Okay, hello everyone. So I'm Dr. Shirley Lee. Um, I'm an associate professor in Department of Psychology at HAU. Um, I'm also a clinical psychologist uh, with uh, unique um, clinical and research interests in sleep and sleep disorders. Um, so today I'm going to, I'm glad to be here to share with you our understanding about sleep. I think sleep is universal. I think everyone here is probably like sleep. So um before I would talk about before I talk about the basis of sleep, I would like to uh, introduce a case for you to uh, to learn about. So this is a male, uh, age eighty one. So he presented with sleep problems for at least ten years. He had frequent um, frequent dreams with violent content, and he often add out his dreams during sleep. As a result, he often um, had injury during sleep. Uh, we saw the bruises over his limb, and sometimes he uh, hit his head. 
um, and he had frequent falls from bed. So as a result, his family have to put mattress on the floor to protect him so that he doesn't fall out of the bed. And there are uh, occasions where um, he punched his wife during sleep when he was acting out his dreams. So physically, he was all fine. So there was no obvious physical illnesses. And so he came to the um, sleep lab for the sleep assessment. So here is the, the night he was uh, in the sleep lab. Let's see what happened. He's just still sleeping, actually. So he's uh, wearing a mask because he has another sleep disorder that is called sleep apnea. But now, as you see what he's doing, um, he's actually still asleep if we look at his brain wave. So as you can imagine, it must be very scary to, to sleep next to him um, because he his behavior was quite violent. So um, I think now he's probably slightly awake feeling confused, not sure what happens. So I'm going to tell you more about this sleep disorder later on. Um, and uh, let's come back to the main focus of today. So I will first briefly introduce some basic concepts about sleep. And then I'll briefly give you some ideas about major sleep disorder. And then we'll focus on that particular sleep disorder that I show you uh, from the video. So we all know about sleep, we know how to sleep. So here's a definition um, of sleep. So we know that it's a behavioral state characterized by um, specific posture, especially for human beings. We lie down with our eyes closed when we are sleeping. And during sleep state, we have reduced motor activity. There was a, there's a suspension of consciousness. So we don't respond to our surrounding while we are fully asleep. Um, so And also, uh, there's a reduction of metabolism during sleep. And interestingly, sleep is unlike other physiological states like coma. We can actually reverse the, the state. So we can switch between sleep and weight. Um, so this is a um, function. This is the, physio the definition of sleep. So one question we often want to ask is why we, do we need to sleep? Because if you think about this, we spend about one third of our life in sleeping. So there must be some reason we, 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 we will spend such a long time in sleeping in our life. Um, so currently, the basic function of sleep, in fact, remain largely uh, a, a mystery. Um, however, we do know that adequate sleep is a biological impurity because you may notice that if you don't have a good night of sleep, the next day, the next day you probably feel very grumpy. Um, you probably find it difficult to concentrate. Um, maybe you cannot uh, do things in a way that you wanted. So we know that sleep is essential, but we don't exactly know uh, every function of sleep. So with the advancement of sleep research, currently we know that sleep may have the function to preserve our energy. Uh, it's important for growth and repair, um, important for metabolism, because if we know that some research showed that sleep deprivation could lead to uh, metabolic problems. Um, and most importantly for students, um, I know most of you probably will sacrifice sleep because you have to do some other things like extracurriculum activities or uh, social activities or study. But you need to re remember that, in fact, a lot of research has shown that sleep is very important uh, for memory consolidation and learning. So um, that's one take home message I often would like students to take away. Um, nonetheless, there are still a lot of things that we don't know about sleep, and hopefully one day you will become one of the sleep researchers just like me to find out uh, what sleep can do for us. So here, I would like to let you know a bit more how we usually assess sleep. 
Um, so there are different approaches for us to understand uh, how people are sleeping. So one way is to buy uh, is to conduct subjective uh, assessment. So we can ask the patient how your sleep was last night, how your sleep was in general over the past one month or past one year. So um, during the clinical interview, we do a comprehensive evaluation of the nature, severity, and the, the natural history of the sleep problems presented by the patients. And we can also ask the patients, or in the research context, we ask the participants uh, to fill out some questionnaires, which are more uh, straightforward and very convenient and time consuming. And then we can also ask participants or the patients to fill out a sleep diary which is very commonly used uh, in the research setting and also clinical practice, especially for assessing insomnia. So here's a diagram to show you what we will distribute usually to participants or the patients. So this is a typical diary we will give them. Uh, we ask them to prospectively document their sleep schedule uh, every day um, over at least seven days. So they're asked to mark, uh, mark uh, what time they went to bed last night, what time they woke up, or how many times they woke up in the middle of the night and et cetera. And here's another diagram uh, is what we call sleep lot that we also will give patients. Uh, usually we will ask the patient to kind of recall uh, their sleep, uh, the sleep schedule. So as you can see from the diagram here, uh, on 28th of November, the, the second, um, so as you can see here on 28th of November here, so uh, the solid dot here represents the time the patient actually went to bed. And the, um, the solid line here represents the period of the time the patient were, was actually asleep. And the circle here indicates the time uh, he or she actually got out of the bed. So if you look at the diagram here, actually, you can tell this patient has some insomnia symptoms. So for example, even though he went to bed around 1.30 at night, it took him a long time to fall, eventually fall asleep. It took him um, two and a half hours. And then he also had frequent awakening during the middle of the night. And at 10 o'clock, he woke up, but he was staying at bed, uh, in bed for at least an hour. So as you can see, that this is, a help, this is actually quite helpful for clinicians to understand how patients were sleeping at home. Um, and uh, also, uh, we can prospectively actually evaluate how the patient's sleep was. So apart from the subjective report, we also have objective measurements. Um, the first uh, objective measurement, which is also what we call gold standard, is called polysonography. So typically patients or participants were invited to the sleep lab to stay for one or two nights. Uh, and we have different measures to collect physiological data. And another approach to measure sleep is what we call actigraphy. So this is a little bit similar to what we what you might be using, like Phoebe or um, App, Apple Watch, um, those commercial device. Although within the research setting, we probably use more sophisticated uh, uh, watch light device. So as you can see from the diagram here, this is the actigraphy. So we usually ask the participant to wear that for um, consecutively several days. Um, the benefit of wearing actigraphy is that it allows us to measure sleep consecutively. Because if you imagine for polysonography, the patients have to stay in the lab. So this is a unnatural environment for the patient. So some people may find it a little bit uncomfortable Whereas for actigraphy, this is intrus uh, not intrusive and it can monitor sleep consecutively. So for the polysonography, although, um, although poly poly polysonography is quite uh, labor intensive, as you can imagine, because we have to monitor the patient throughout the whole night, it remains to be the gold standard because it tells us a lot of information about the physiological activity. So we measure uh, brainwave activity during polysonography. We measure muscle activity and also eye movements. Um, so this is a picture what, uh, to show you what it's going to be like if you are, you are admitted into the sleep lab for sleep test. So as you can see, we have the sensor to measure the, uh, the airflow. 
We also have the elastic belt to measure the effort to breathe. Um, this is important for, to, uh, for diagnosing certain sleep disorder. And we also have a finger, um, uh, the finger uh, sensor here to measure the oxygen level. So just to, uh, just to show you a quick video about how sleep assessment is like, uh, especially at HKU. So sorry, I only have this, uh, the narrative things in Cantonese, but you can look at the subtitle in English. Okay, so that was a quick video to show you what is it like if you are to admit it into uh, our sleep lab for sleep test. Um, it's also similar in the hospital if you are admitted into hospital for uh, diagnosis of sleep disorder. So as you can recall, we collect physiological data, including our uh, brainwave activity. So based on different brainwave activities, we can actually differentiate the whole sleep period into different stages. So for example, we have the wake period and also the sleep period, including uh, non-rapid eye movement sleep and rapid eye movement sleep. So that's the two main sleep stages. And within the non-rapid eye movement sleep, we have stage one, stage two, and stage three. And during different sleep stages, you can see the brainwave activities are quite different. So I'm not going to um, the details here, but just to let you know um, and get a basic idea. So basically our, our sleep is not static. So once we fall asleep, we actually move into different sleep stages from the lightest sleep stage to the deepest sleep stage. So at the beginning, you may be um, get entering the stage one. So often maybe when you're dosing off in your class or in your meeting, you're actually in stage one already, okay? And then gradually you go into stage two, which is also called the light sleep. Um, and uh, stage two actually um, is uh, around 40, in fact, around 40 to 55% of the night is spent in light sleep, stage two. 
And then we move into stage three, which is what we call slow wave sleep or deep sleep. This is the deepest uh, stage of sleep uh, throughout the night. So some people will ask me, so can I get more deep sleep? I would like to have more deep sleep. Um, and the answer actually is that we don't, we cannot kind of increase the deep, uh, deep sleep throughout the night. We usually look at the proportion. So the normal people usually spend certain proportion in different sleep stages. So we cannot have deep sleep throughout the whole night. Um, and then finally, we have REM sleep. Um, this is during this uh, sleep period, our brain is actually very uh, active because if you look at the brain wave, uh, actually, uh, it is quite similar to, uh, to the brain waves during wakefulness. Um, however, during this period, our eye we have eye movements and also interestingly our muscle is paralyzed so this is actually a protective mechanism because if you look at the patients from the video he was actually acting out moving his bodies during REM sleep but in fact for normal people we have a protective uh, mechanisms paralyzing all of all of our muscles so even if you're dreaming uh, of hitting your teachers in your dreams, you probably would not be able to enact that in your sleep because you have this mechanism to protect you. However, when your brain, uh, something's wrong with your brain, uh, you can actually see that in your sleep because actually that's the brain protecting you. So throughout the night, uh, we actually go through different sleep stages. Usually there are four to five sleep cycle in a typical night. So this is a video just to show you uh, what is it like during REM sleep. Uh, if you have a baby at home or you have the dog, you can actually look at their eyes. You can tell they are having REM sleep. So you can see that their eye mo eyes are moving, okay? Okay, so I probably am running out of time just to show you we have a lot of sleep disorders. One day when you come to Hong Kong, you, you can learn from me, okay? Um, and then the, the sleep disorder I just show you is called REM sleep behavior disorder. And it's actually a very fascinating sleep disorder because the dramatic presentation, as you can see, the patient was acting out, uh, presenting with vigorous movement during sleep. So what is unique about that is that there has been increasing evidence to show that REM sleep behavior disorder is actually a precursor of neurodegenerative disorders. So patients initially presented with this disorder and gradually over time, we can see that um, nearly over 80% of RBD patients actually eventually develop Parkinsonism or dementia over at least 10 years of follow-up. So this is an import this is very important because that means that perhaps we um identifying this sleep disorder actually can provide uh, a windows for us to think about neuroprotective treatments because we know that currently we cannot uh, reverse the neurodegenerations. Um, so identifying this sleep disorder is actually very uh, important and there's a lot of research going on um, to look into this sleep disorder in, in relation to neurodegeneration. So anyway, so because of a time constraint, I will have to stop it here. Um, if you're interested, you can follow our IG or go to our left website. Um, and uh, we also have a lot of studies for secondary school students. So we, uh, you're welcome to join our studies. And I also look forward to welcoming you uh, at HKU next year. And you can join our labs as a research interns. Okay, thank you. Right. So thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for the really interesting talk. Sleep, of course, affects um, all of us, especially high school students, often don't get a lot of sleep. Um, so if you guys have questions, uh, in the interest of time, maybe we'll save it for the end. So please hang around and then approach us at the front. We'll still hang around for a bit. Um, but for now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our last speaker, last but not least, um, Dr. Francis Jin. So Dr. Francis is an expert in emotion and thinking processes such as decision making. And there's a particular focus on psychological and neural mechanisms of anxiety and depression. So also very interesting topics that might affect a lot of us in the future. Um, so whenever you're ready. Um, all right, great. 
Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great uh, pleasure to be here with you. So uh, I'm also a clinical psychologist, uh, just like my colleagues. Uh, I'm a US licensed clinical psychologist and also affective neuroscientist. So my research generally focuses on understanding human emotions, as well as emotion related uh, mental health issues, such as depression or anxiety. So today I'm going to give a very brief overview of some mainstream theories of emotions, okay? Um, so you guys perhaps know in 2016, AlphaGo and artificial intelligence from Google DeepMind beat the uh, South Korean gold master Lee Sejun, making news headlines. And this year, uh, you may have heard that ChatGPT has already stirred up claims as well as concerns globally, right? So with these uh, amazing advancements in technology, so uh, there are more... Um, more of us like pushing and to think about what is so special about us human beings then. So if artificial intelligence can do so many things, then like what make us special? So whenever I discuss this question with friends or colleagues, uh, almost always emotion becomes one of the first uh, things coming to mind. So emotion seems to be really one of the most, if not the most quintessential human feature, okay? So the power of emotion, comes from that they have the ability to motivate us. In ancient Greek philosophy, for example, Plato in his charioteer analogy described how humans are driven by passion, represented here by the two horses. Okay? Uh, and passion is basically an alternative term for emotion. Indeed, just like uh, artificial intelligence is programmed by lines of code to achieve certain goals, we humans are programmed by nature to uh, be motivated by our emotions. And this idea is also well stated by the 17th century uh, French philosopher René Descartes. Emotions have very important functions and they move uh, and dispose souls to want the things for which they prepare the body. In other words, we are motivated to obtain our goals guided by our emotion. Then people usually see emotions sit at the opposite side of rationality. So either one's rational mind is at work so that this person is fact-driven, reasonable, attentive, um, or the emotional mind is at work. Uh, so this person will be distracted, in distressed, or impulsive. Well, the idea that emotion and rationality cannot coexist it seems really ubiquitous, at least in Western culture. Um, and in parallel, we often see such a dichotomized depiction of the cold rational brain on one hand versus the hot emotional brain on the other hand. However, as we now know that this is far from what psychology and neuroscience data tell us. In fact, the same parts of the brain that are heavily involved in generating thoughts, attention and decision-making are also heavily involved in our emotional life. So, then what is emotion to start with? Can you think of some emotions? Okay. Likely, um, a, a bunch of words like this may pop up into our mind. So emotions are feelings include, for example, happiness, sadness, fear, and anger, as well as those more complex ones, such as shame, guilt, or frustration. But these are specific types of emotions. And the term emotion itself became regularly used in English vocabulary around the mid 19th century, translated from French. While the term emotion is relatively recent in our vocabulary, the phenomena the term describes is a part of human history. Alternative words such as passion, sentiment, appetite, pathos, etc., have been used throughout history. Obviously, here we are talking about English terms, um, but we also have similar terms or characters uh, describing emotions in Chinese, uh, Korean, Japanese, Indian, and so on and so forth. The emotional experience in, is indeed, in that sense, ubiquitous across cultures. These folk terms and the phenomena they describe have inspired studies and theories um, in, like, across centuries, um, uh, uh, like, uh, like inspiring scientists to think about where do emotion come from biologically, psychologically, and culturally, and also what are the specific functions of emotions. For example, Charles Darwin is actually among the earliest scientists who developed formal theories on emotion. Well, naturally, he came. Uh, he took a very evolutionary perspective and came up with the principles of emotion expressions. 
In his view, emotions are evolved to increase our chance of survival. And the way we express our emotions are the legacies of our ancestors. Then William James, the highly influential psychologist in the early 20th century, also formulated a major theory of emotion. He stresses how our emotions, our feelings, arise from physiology. So in the past centuries, past century, numerous psychologists and neuroscientists have built or formalized uh, insightful novel theories and, uh, uh, and gathered new data uh, that help us understanding what emotion really is. And currently, we call the field that studies emotion and related phenomena affective science. So now this uh, may sound surprising to you, there is actually no agreed upon definition of what emotion is. And moreover, there's no single model or theory of emotion that is accepted unanimously. This lack of consensus on the most fundamental aspect of this field is perhaps due to the complexity of emotion. Generally speaking, there are three approaches when we think about or conceptualize emotion. So theories that see emotion as a type of feeling stress the subjective experience of emotions. Then we have theories that see emotion as a, a motivation. So these type of theories would stress the consequences of emotion, like what you do and how you react to it. And then theories uh, see emotion as valuation would stress the goodness versus badness uh, judgment. Across these variety of emotion-related theories, however, there are main features shared by almost all of them. First, an emotion needs to be about something. That means emotion is evoked response. There must be an object and reason for the emotional response. Okay? For example, being scolded by your teacher or your parent would make you feel sad or angry so that there is a clear cause of your emotional response. Related to this, emotion is time limited. Most of sci affective scientists consider an emotional response lasts about a few seconds to a few minutes. So when it lasts longer, like um, if we are saying that, okay, I'm feeling sad in the past several days, we call that mood. For mood, you don't have to have a specific cause of it, okay? Then thirdly, uh, emotion has an evaluative nature. When we say someone is in an emotion, we, we mean that this person is feeling either something positive or negative or a mixture, uh, but just not neutral, okay? And then lastly, uh, sorry, not lastly, fine, uh, like uh, uh, emotion, uh, the fourthly, uh, emotion is accompanied by bodily changes. Okay. So for example, we may say we feel hot when we, when we are angry and we may say our feel like our hands are trembling when we are scared. So these are bodily changes. Last but not the least, although not a very necessary component across all theories, we can be aware of how we are feeling. So if I ask you, how are you feeling right now? You can tell me. So this means emotion is a conscious experience. Okay. So due to the time limit, next we're gonna turn to two mainstream theories of emotion. So one major view is that there are natural categories of human emotions or what scientists call basic emotions. These emotions, like indicated by Darwin, are consequences of evolution. Various basic emotion theories exist, but they all propose that there are a limited number of basic emotions, for example, six or seven. And these basic emotions that they claim that are shared across all human cultures. Okay. In addition, according to this theory, so each emotion uh, is comprised of a specific distinct set of features. Okay. Um, because of that, so people across different cultures can basically tell how one is feeling based on their facial expressions. So this emotional language in terms of facial expression uh, is, uh, is trans culture in that sense. So one of the perhaps most famous studies in affective science in psychology is the New Guinea research conducted by the American psychologist Paul Ekman in the 1960s. So Dr. Ekman uh, went to the highlands, uh, a like in, in, in Guinea, uh, a place where it's, it was isolated by Western influence back then. 
So according to uh, Dr. Ackman, so what, what he wanted to test is that if there are really basic emotions, then, um, you know, for a culture that is never influenced by Western uh, culture, then uh, if those people can, can have the same uh, emotional concepts as people uh, say would have in, in America, then that would be an evidence supporting this idea. So he came to this um, isolated uh, I area and basically he asked the local uh, people uh, to, uh, so questions, for example, like imagine that a friend has come to visit you. And then he showed these local people a bunch of uh, uh, facial expression pictures and let them to choose let them choose from these pictures which one would best fit in that story so the results basically show that um, so for the uh, local uh, people so they would actually choose the same picture uh, like an American person would actually choose so basically this this research supported that there may be some base uh, emotions uh, or emotion related concepts that are shared across like different cultures. So let's give it a try to see how easy this may be. Okay, what are the emotions the figures in these pictures are experiencing? Okay, think about it. So based on the basic emotion theory, by their expressions, you may think that they are all feeling sad. However, with a little bit of more contextual information, you may uh, lead to quite different conclusions. So clockwise, here we have a basketball player celebrating a dunk, and then we have like Mexico football fans celebrating a win. And then we have Adele like winning a Grammy award. And then we have Justin Bieber's fan crying excitedly outside of a concert. So these are all positive events. And it is perhaps really unlikely that these people uh, in these pictures are feeling sad or otherwise negative emotions. So such complexity and flexibility of emotion expression are really hard to explain by the basic emotion theories. By the way, if you know the, the movie Inside Out, that was actually based on the basic emotion theory, okay? Um, there are indeed multiple problems with the basic emotion theory. Uh, first of all, whereas the basic emotion theory stresses emotion being prepackaged, hardwired uh, due to evolution, we now know that emotions identified as a standalone category in one culture may not exist in the other culture. For example, there's no English word for Schadenfreude in German. Uh, and uh, another example would be if you if you uh, speak like at least two languages, then you know it's very difficult to translate emotion related uh, experiences between languages. Okay. Uh, so further uh, furthermore, there is really like of emotional fingerprints. So that is a set of distinct bodily uh, reactions that can discriminate one emotion from another. So even like basic emotions, like sad, happy, fear, or angry, we can't really tell very reliably a lot of the times. According to the psychologist Deputia Mesquita, the idea of a culturally invariant core of basic emotions was more of an ideology than scientific truth. Uh, like Dr. Mesquita, a group of researchers represented by Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett and James Russell have come to propose that instead of prepackaged and given uh, by evolution, emotions can be flexibly constructed. So how do we construct an emotion? Well, we need some ingredients. According to this theory, as well as scientific data, the foundations of emotion are not six or seven distinct categories, but instead are two dimensions. We call them villains and arousal. Villains ranges from displeasure to pleasure, or you may say from, positive, from negativity to positivity. And arousal ranges from being like sleepy to uh, highly awake, indicating how alert one is. Uh, importantly, negative does not mean uh, or necessarily mean bad, and positive does not, does not necessarily mean good. For example, uh, feeling sad at a funeral is totally expected, and feeling euphoria, which is a positive emotion, right, uh, uh, during a uh, manic episode will cause you a lot of trouble. Okay, so uh, these two th these two dimensions together forms what we call core effect. In daily language, you would call that a feeling. Okay. This is the key ingredient to construct an emotion. Uh, at any given moment, the core effect or feeling can be described by how much pleasure we are feeling and how alert we are. 
for instance, uh, when you meet your best friend, let's say after three years of COVID for the first time in person, you are perhaps quite excited and elated. And this emotion can be represented by a positive valence and relatively positive uh, high arousal. In contrast, if you're preparing for a difficult and high stress, highly stressful exam, then what you are feeling perhaps is on the negative valence, but high arousal end as well. Okay. Um, so th these feelings or core affect is really like a temper, like thermometer, uh, like detecting temperature. So these feelings or core affect is basically telling how well we are, how like psychologically and phys uh, and uh, physiologically in our environment. And then to experience uh, an emotion, there needs to be a change in your core affect. But just having the change in core affect is not enough. According to this theory, when there is a change in your core effect, it is natural for our brain to search for the cause of that change from our external environment. We then attribute uh, or assign the change of our core feeling to the identified object, and we call that the cause of our emotion. Meanwhile, uh, there are a lot of other things happening. For example, what actions you are taking, uh, how, you are, how you are evaluating the situation, and what you are doing for emotional emotional experience. Now with this complex chart, uh, the, it leaves a room uh, for, our, for uh, context, prior knowledge, as well as our life experience to affect how we are feeling. Because uh, these, these experiences of prior knowledge influence how we are interpreting the world. Here is a concrete example. Imagine that you are sweating, breathing heavily, and your heart is beating very fast. Well, this could be due to either you're in a panic mode or you just finish a 5K, okay? So basically this means the brain needs more information than uh, your, like your pure bodily sensations to, to actually tell what kind of emotion you are feeling, okay? For the sake of time, I'm going to uh, very quickly uh, go through this slide. So um, uh, actually in terms of like the basic dimensions of emotion, there had been a new research showing that maybe it's not a two, not a seven, um, but perhaps a 27 or even more. So the, the research on the very basic structure of emotion is still ongoing, okay? And so all of that, and also uh, like our colleagues uh, lectures earlier on, basically tell us our brain is not a passive uh, machine, uh, simply responding to what's going on in our environment. Instead, according to the Bayesian brain hypothesis or predictive processing theory, so our brain uh, constantly predicts uh, what we are going to encounter next and, and uh, sorry, constantly use, uh, predicts as well as using prior experience and knowledge to interpret what's, uh, what's going on. In other words, the brain is a hardware of a belief system, okay? And this means what you are expecting to experience and what you are attending to highly affect what we are going to experience. For example, uh, here, it may be really difficult to see what that thing is. However, if I'm providing you more contextual information, it becomes really easy to see that, oh, that's, a, uh, that's part of a house and trees. From, uh, this is a painting from Claude Monet. Okay, so it is this idea or this, this capacity of human brain to utilize contextual information to help us interpret what is going on um, that is what making our life that's uh, very smooth. In fact, identifying what things uh, in that particular picture is really difficult for artificial intelligence. Okay, so the same idea now can be used to study how emotion arises. Um, so researchers these days have been using uh, like computer programs and that is programming like a different components. Like for example, what is the villains, the arousal, and what is the, uh, the context we are in. So all these things together and can lead to a conclusion that uh, like this, uh, this agent is in a certain emotion. So what this means is that we can now use statistical or quantitative models and implement, implement them uh, in uh, like computer programs to actually simulate uh, like algorithms uh, that can experience emotions just like human beings. Okay, so 
if you are interested in both computer science or artificial intelligence and like emotion, then uh, you are you know please come and join psychology. Basically, uh, you can uh, utilize those those skills together to unravel the mystery of emotion. Okay, just to quickly summarize. Uh, we talked about that emotions are natural motivators evolved to facilitate our survival. Uh, but this does not mean that emotions like fear, happiness, and sadness are hardwired and uh, reflexive. The highly influential basic emotion theory has been challenged, and the constructivist view holds that an emotion is generated based on core affect as well as other information in the context. And affective science is an interesting uh, like interdisciplinary field uh, uh, wherein scientists conduct a psychological experiment, examine the biological responses, and build quantitative models to gain a deeper understanding of emotion, this quintessential feature of human. Okay, thank you. With that, I would like to welcome questions, if we have time. Yep. So thank you very much, Dr. Jin, for the informative talk. So um, guys, in the interest of time, we're out of time. But if you have questions, please hang around. Please feel free to come to the front and um, ask our speakers and talk to us. Um, also, if you haven't visited our department yet, it's on the sixth floor. Um, it's still open for a little bit, so you can try and catch it and then have a look around and then see what different types of stuff there are. Um, but if not, then thank you, everyone, for coming. It's been really nice to see you all. Yay.